So have you ever heard about computational thinking? It's okay, when I started the project, guess what? I had never heard of it either. And when it came to our group that was working, this was before the grant, I, I think I was the slowest one in the bunch. I was so embarrassed. It took me forever to figure out what we were talking about. And then the next thing I know, I figured it out and we got a grant. So that was exciting. So it shows you can start at zero and just gradually, little by little, work your way up. All right, here we go. What is CT? And then we're gonna talk about CT and teaching and learning since as librarians, we are all teachers. We teach in the largest classroom in the school. And then learning, since our students are our learners. We're gonna talk about why CT in libraries. Why is it so important librarians address this? We're going to talk about stories, storytelling, and how it relates to computational thinking. Then we are going to be creating some very, very fun stories. And we're gonna talk about next time where we're going to bring coding into computational thinking and storytelling. So first, what is computational thinking? So there are so many different definitions and the focus of the definition depends on who is defining it, right? Don't worry, I'm not reading all these words. Don't panic. Uh, these are four common uh, definitions. We have Jeanette Wing. She, is basically the queen of computational thinking or the mother of computational thinking. She used to work for Microsoft and her focus is very much on the computer, right? Um, we have Google for Education. We have ISTE, are you familiar with ISTE? International Society for Technology Education. They hold a conference every year. Although they're international, it's only ever in the United States, which to me is very disappointing, but it is an amazing, amazing organization. And then I have OITP, which is the American Library Association Office of Information Technology Policy. So if you see I have some words highlighted, if we look at the commonalities in each of the definitions, all the pink refers to process, processes. The green talks about solutions and solving. The orangish color talks about problems. Uh, and the blue talks about transferability, connections across disciplines, and then the purple talks about data. So all these definitions have these things in common. So what is computational thinking? I created my own definition because that's what I do. It made sense to me more so than the others. For you, one of the others may make sense or you may make your own. So I say it's an ordered or systematic problem-solving process that is transferable from computer science to K through 12, education into other facets of our lives, including college, career, and everyday life issues. So I was teaching this one semester and my student, Lisa German, she's now a librarian, a fabulous one at that, emailed me and said, uh, your definition's okay, but it's kind of missing something. And I said, okay, give it a shot. And she did, and I think she really she made it better. I love it when my students help me grow. She said computational thinking involves taking a large scale problem and breaking it down into smaller components to make it more manageable. These components are then organized and further analyzed to help create a solution. So in my technology course, uh, when we're learning about computational thinking, I have my students come up with a flow chart where they walk through the computational thinking process to solve a problem. They can pick a real problem in their life or they can make up something because I'm not going to force them to share any information. And over the years, I saw some patterns as well as some anomalies. And some of the problems that were most frequently solved by my students included organizing a kitchen or a closet or a library, um, making a garden, planning a trip, uh, running a half marathon, that one's been very, very popular, uh, selecting a pet. Although one year a student couldn't decide at the end and decided she was just gonna create her very own hybrid between a cat and a dog. Um, and then I have a few anomalies. I had one student email me and said she'd been sick for months and the doctor couldn't figure out what was going on. She was frustrated. We learned about computational thinking. She started playing around with the concept, did a little internet research and she figured out what was wrong with herself. Now, I'm not a doctor, I'm not telling you to play your own doctor. I'm just giving you an example of one 
students. Um, so what are the concepts? First, you have a problem, right? Maybe it's a small problem, maybe it's a big problem. Have you ever had a problem in your life? Anybody? Just me? Oh, I see a couple hands up. <laughs> um, so first things, you know, you have a problem, it's overwhelming, right? It's massive, you can't breathe, whatever. First thing you do, it's decomposition. Decomp decomposition or decompose. You take that problem, whether it's a computer problem, whether it's a personal problem, and you break it down, you break down the data processes or problems into smaller, more manageable parts, so it's not as overwhelming. So you have little bitty parts of the bigger problem. And then pattern recognition, as the name suggests, you look at patterns, trends, and regularities across the different parts. And then algorithm design, when we think of algorithms, we think of computers, of course. Then you look at these patterns and you create step-by-step -step instructions for solving this problem and similar problems. And abstraction is where you look at the general principles. So you're not looking at the specifics, you're looking at the general principles that generate the patterns. You focus on only the important information. You ignore irrelevant details and apply it to similar problems. And now I'm going to give you an example. It's kind of depressing and I'm sorry. Um, but it's meaningful to me. Uh, a family member several years ago was going through a really rough time. Miserable at her job. Uh, her dad was dying. Her son uh, was being extremely difficult. She just, she couldn't function. So she called me one night and she started crying and she said, hey, I have completely left my house go and I don't know what to do. She said, I think it's beyond repair. I'm overwhelmed. I need help and I can't get help. What do I do? And I said, okay, well, let's, let's talk about it. You know, what's going on? So she's telling me about some of the issues in her life. And I said, well, you know, can we try something? She said, yeah, I'm, I'll try anything at this point. I said, okay, so first, you say you want to get your house back in order, but you feel like you can't do it because it's too overwhelming, right? I said, get a piece of paper, get a pen. Write down each room in your house. Kitchen, living room, bathroom, bedroom. I said, now, in the kitchen, make a list of the things that need to be fixed. And she said, okay, well, there are dirty dishes everywhere. There's pet issues on the floor. There's expired food. There's laundry on the floor. I said, okay, go into the living room. Make a list of what's going on. She said, well, there's dirty laundry on the floor. There's clean laundry on the couch. There are books everywhere, dead plants. So we go through each room. I said, okay. So it's more manageable, right? We're not looking at the whole house. We're just looking at one room. And then I said, okay, now look, where do you see patterns? And she said, well, there's dirty laundry in every single room. I said, okay, what else? There are dead plants in most rooms. Okay, what else? Well, dirty dishes in my bedroom, living room, kitchen. Okay, what else? So we go through, we make the list. And I said, okay, now let's make a plan. What are we gonna do? And she said, I don't know. And I said, how about, what's the easiest thing to fix? And she said, carry the dirty dishes into the, sink, or into the kitchen. And I said, step one. Step two, what's that? Wash five dishes. Okay, that's good. Step three, wash another five dishes. That kind of thing, right? So that's all you're going to do. So the next day, what's another easy thing? She said, well, I can get rid of all the, the dead plants. And so we made step-by-step -step plan for her to slowly solve her problem, right? So we decomposed, we looked for patterns, we developed an algorithm, and then, because computational thinking, I had to throw in abstraction, how could she use this in other aspects of her life? So, for example, her father, uh, before he passed away, he was a hoarder, and he left us all quite an issue, which was very overwhelming. Um, at work, she's a teacher. You know what it's like. It's very overwhelming, right? No matter what you do, there's more to do. Like, how could she use computational thinking to make her job more manageable? And she said, what is that? That's a really cool thing. What is it called? Like, how did you know to do this? And I said, it's computational thinking. And she said, what's that? And I said, it's the thing I've been studying for four years. <laughs> She forgot, it's, it's understandable. So some of you are visual, like pictures, some of you are visual with words, some of you need to hear. I like words, but I did grab a visual from the BBC illustrating the computational thinking concepts. So decomposition, you have your big problem, and then you break it into two smaller problems, 
and then the two into two, and then the two into two into two, into two so you have eight, right? Pattern recognition is where you're looking for patterns after you've broken that problem down. And then abstraction and algorithm can go either way. You can flip-flop them. Um, abstraction is where you take your solution and apply it to other areas. And algorithm is, of course, your steps, like your recipe. First of all, we're back to ISTE, the International Society for Technology and Education. They have standards. We talked uh, an evidence-based practice about using standards. They have standards for what students need to learn. And ISTE identifies computational thinking as a critical literacy. It's something our students need to know in this day and age to solve problems. In technology, but also, let's face it, in real life. ISTE also has standards for educators. So what you as teachers, technology-wise, should be teaching. And they also emphasize computational thinking creating learning opportunities that challenge students to use CT to innovate and solve problems. So that, again, ties back into evidence-based practice, where you want your work to be standards-based. OK, so I pulled an example from one of my students. It's really good. I'm going to be honest. My dad was a science teacher. I'm not very good at science. <laughs> like, this is a physics example, and my student did a wonderful job, and I will do the best I can to work through it. Um, so in science, students learn about simple machines. Inquiry-based experimentation helps students discover patterns. So the problem her students were addressing was how can you find the ideal number of pulleys to use to lift an object, and how much string will you need to lift an object with that number of pulleys? So first, they broke it down into number of pulleys, the force in newtons, and the distance pulled in string. And they picked random numbers to play with. So they experiment with the equipment, they decide what to measure, and then they record information in a data table. Then they looked for patterns. They noticed that as the number of pulleys increase, the force required decreases, and the distance of string that is pulled increases. They noticed that the number of pulleys times 10 so the distance the object moved equals the distance the string was pulled. And then they noticed dividing the weight of the object in newtons by the number of pulleys equals the force required to lift an object. I'd say those 10th graders are much further advanced than I am in physics. Then they created step-by-step -step instructions for solving this problem. First, find an object to move. Find the weight of the object. Measure the distance it needs to move. Use one equation to calculate the force. Use another equation to calculate how far the string will need to be pulled. So they came up with two equations. And then they, uh, for abstraction, you're identifying the general principles and seeing how you can apply those two equations to other situations. And they decided uh, they can design a pulley system with the optimal number of pulleys and strings so a person can move a heavy object with little force. This information would be helpful to people who lift heavy equipment at like construction sites, who design sailboats, or even to lift things into a treehouse. Um, and then they can also look for patterns and write algorithms for other simple machines and make predictions for the force. So this is just one example in science. Again, I said my students, they have examples for history, uh, poetry, writing. So that's just your general classroom, right? But as librarians, we teach all subjects. We work with all teachers. So that's why I provided that example. So why computational thinking in libraries? What does this have to do with us? Computational thinking addresses critical thinking, right? It addresses literacy. As librarians, what is our focus? Literacy. Whether it's basic literacy, focusing on words, whether it's visual literacy, teaching our students how to read pictures, if it's media literacy, teaching our students how to interpret the news, or um, information literacy, obviously that's the big one, right? We need our students to have critical thinking skills. And so I pulled some information from the World Economic Forum on the future of jobs. And there's a list of the top 10 skills in 2005, and then the top 10 skills in 2020. And if you look at the order, complex problem solving has been number one for almost 20 years now. Critical thinking 
jumped up to number two. Creativity jumped up to number three. Um, cognitive flexibility showed up for the first time. Judgment and decision making jumped up. These are all skills your students can learn through computational thinking. So you're preparing them for the workforce. You're preparing them to succeed in school. You're preparing them to address their own problems in their own lives. So again, why CT and libraries? Libraries, we are, even if it's not physically the largest classroom, it's still the largest classroom, right? We serve all students, ideally. To me, that's one of the most amazing parts about being a librarian. We get to interact with all the students. We get to do innovative, informal and formal learning within the library. I think often we have a little bit more freedom than some of the classroom teachers do. Uh, we teach technology skills. We teach information literacy skills. So it goes hand in hand with CT. We can collaborate with the science teacher, with the English teacher, with the history teacher, math teacher, um, to apply CT in other curricular areas uh, and help develop critical thinking skills in those areas. And then we're preparing students for their educational careers and their professional careers and also, as I noted, everyday life issues, even if it's not the extent of the example I gave. So youth developing computational thinking literacy, it's about learning. Uh, as I mentioned, informal and formal learning spaces that libraries are, and you as an information professional are helping students develop the literacy. Uh, about librarianship, librarianship is about equal access to all of our students, right? Access to the library, access to resources, access to opportunities. And then about the social impact because you're preparing your students for success. So what does it look like in libraries? It's collaborative, it's hands-on, it can be high-tech, it can be no-tech. It can be whatever you want it to be with whatever resources you have. That's one of the great things about it. Um, you can use novels and stories to develop questions for identifiable problems that are relatable to the students. We were talking earlier about literature, right? And giving students access to books where they can see themselves in those stories, but then also where they can see others and develop, as was mentioned earlier, empathy. Uh, collaborating with teachers, uh, providing opportunities to let students develop their technology skills, and then incorporating STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and math, and then coding, um, and integrating computational thinking into that. It can really be applied to any discipline, as I've noted. Uh, you can introduce this to teachers and have them integrate. And then makerspaces, which Joe will be talking about tomorrow, they offer a variety of ways to integrate computational thinking into learning. The steps are posted on a chart that students can refer to. Other times, I'll ask them, how can we use decomposition to help us out here? If students are really going to learn and apply it, they need to do it regularly, right? Practice makes, if not perfect, at least better. Uh, she said one of her favorite things that came out of one of their lessons was the students making connections to CT. Um, and so one group of students said they could use CT to help with a project that was coming up. Um, another one connected it to problems when playing video games. Another one said uh, he was using CT to improve his free throws in basketball. So basically the possibilities are endless, just get creative. And then another one, Amy Williams, a former student, current librarian. Um, she received a makerspace grant in her library and she integrated computational thinking into that. Every month she does a makerspace lesson she puts students into groups. They have to work collaboratively, which, as we know, is a skill students need for success in the classroom, but also in the workforce. Um, and then they use the CT model to solve whatever problem they're working on in the makerspace. And she said she saw reported growth in less than a year, that they're a lot more confident in their ability to solve problems. So now I'm going to turn it over to Joe, where he's going to talk about stories. First of all, how many of you have heard about uh, Joseph Campbell? So Joseph Campbell 
went around the world in the 1940s and was studying folklore, mythology, and stories from all around the world. And he found several commonalities between all of them. And he put these all together inside of a model. He said, everyone around the world has the same way of telling a story. All the stories are pretty much the same. They're just slight variations in each one of them. But there's 12 steps in each one of these. It was a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And um, what he says about stories is that stories are just the projection of people's myths. It's the dream come alive about a culture's myths and a culture's being of who they are. So I'm going to walk you through. These are the steps that he identified. First, in every story, think about a novel that you've read. Think about your own stories that you've heard growing up. It starts off in the normal world, the ordinary world that we all live in. From there, we get some kind of call to adventure. Something strikes us to go, go search for the mountain, go find a mythical sword, go find a mythical animal, just go and head somewhere. There's some kind of call. And the hero usually, in order to have a good story, refuses the call. They say, I don't want to leave my home. I have my family here. I'm safe. I have good food, good friends. Why do I want to take a risk? Why would I want to leave home? Which I'm sure a lot of you have done. And that's the refusal of the call. The next thing within stories is usually some kind of meeting with the mentor. The person goes out and they run into somebody, and maybe it's another traveler that tells them, oh, you know, there's a road over there. I've heard about this thing you're searching for. Take that road. Go up that mountain. Find a stream. Find this animal. This animal's going to talk to you and tell you something. Right? A lot of these things are happening in the different cultures. Then we get to crossing the first threshold. There's some kind of challenge. Something challenges us and makes us want to turn home and makes us scared and makes us want to go back. Our first challenge that we really cross. Then we run into different tests, allies that we find, more friends, maybe other people are searching for something, enemies along the way. Things are trying to stop you from accomplishing what you want to. And just think about a novel that you've read and see if you can place that in here. Think about it, your own story that you've told somebody. If somebody asks you, how did you become a librarian? You're probably telling a story that's following something similar to this. I was in this ordinary world. I got this call. I decided I wanted to try it. Decided, oh, I don't know if I want to do this or not. I'm comfortable be doing what I do. You met a mentor. Right? There's a lot of mentors in this room right now. All of you, I'm sure, are mentors to your students. You may be that mentor in your student story that they're writing right now, this life story that they're creating. The next is the approach to the innermost, darkest cave. This is when it gets the toughest, when you don't think you can do it anymore. You're not sure if you're going to make it past the challenge. You're scared. Maybe you're lonely. You're frightened. You're starting to change inside of you. You're saying, I need to pass this. It's where a lot of people quit. But the people that quit, we don't want that story. Well, that doesn't become a story. You have to push through. The hero must continue on and move. Then you run into the ordeal, some kind of challenge. Maybe um, if it's a movie, there might be some kind of sword fight. There might be a car chase. There might be something. There's a big ordeal that's happening. They get the reward. They actually capture something. They get what they're looking for. But they have to make their way back home now because the hero's gone and they accomplished it. But now they have to come home. So they start going back, and that's the road back home. And they have this type of resurrection. The resurrection because they were something. They accomplished what they needed to, and then they became something else. They became something more than what they were before. They're a hero now. They were just a regular person, but now they've changed. Think about your own stories, think about something you've read, and then you return with the reward. You return back home, but the hero goes back home. You're a new person, you have a new degree, you have a new job, you have something changed about you, and you're coming back to where you were. And this is a story that's done in many, many religions, uh, especially we can look at uh, stories of uh, in Christianity, the story of Christ follows something similar to this. In other, um, Religions in India, they, a lot of the stories of the, of the gods in Hinduism follow this type of story. For each one of them in Greek mythology, they follow this type of story. So these are seen all over the world. What this actually is, in computer language, this is called an algorithm. This is a set of rules that we follow, a set of standards, a set of templates that we follow, that every time you go through, it's going to give you almost the exact same outcome. If you go through this story, if you go through these steps, you're going to have a good story you're going to have the story of a hero coming out. And this is used in everything from books to folklore to songs to comic books, manga, everything. I have a lot of friends that work in, uh, on TV shows and work in movies. 
and they learn the hero's journey in school. And they decide this is too much, it's too, too many steps. So they shrunk it down, especially for like a television show that's 25 minutes or 30 minutes. They said, no, that's too much. So they change it to something like this. It says, you, which is the character that you identify with, you need to have something, you wish for something. You have a wish, so you need something, you go. You need to go, you need to go somewhere to find it. You search, you're searching for it, you're going all around the road, you find it, whether you actually want it or not. Because sometimes we have a goal, we go for it, and we realize that maybe that's not actually what we wanted. And that happens with hero stories too. Sometimes you have to take it, right? You have to take what you wanted, return back home, and you come back to the world where you started, and then you've been changed because you've gone through this journey now, and then you're back at the top. In drama, you would see that this is the beginning of order, act one, going into chaos, and into chaos, and then there's back to order again, right? Because when you return home, there's an order. But this is the fun part of the story, it's the chaos, right? This is what makes things interesting, because when things aren't necessarily going the way you planned, it's maybe not interesting when you're in it, when that's you, but when you come out and you tell that story, this is what people want to hear about. Right, that's the fun part, that, that's the drama. That's, that's what makes things exciting. This is also an algorithm. We follow these steps and you're gonna get the same thing over and over and over. The same way that you would do it with a computer program. So just one more time. You need to go, search, find something, take it, return home, changed. Order to chaos. So in computational thinking, Jennifer was talking about the problem statement. Coming up with some kind of problem that we're trying to solve. Whether that's, uh, for us, what we're gonna be doing, so we're gonna be making a story in the next, as soon as I finish talking, basically. We're gonna create a story together using an algorithm. We're gonna have a problem statement that's gonna come up, some kind of cohesive story using disconnected pieces. So we're gonna give you some random pieces of a story, little blocks, you can see Jennifer's holding them up over there, and they're gonna have random words on it. And we're gonna put those random words together, thank you. We're gonna put those random words together in order to build a story. The next part is decomposition. So decomposition, we talked about when you have a problem, you wanna break that problem down into smaller pieces because those pieces become more manageable. So by decomposing the story, we can think about it as act one, act two, act three in a play, or act one, you need to go. Act two, search for something, find it and take it. And act three, return changed. So we're gonna use this model in order to build our stories out of completely random pieces of blocks that we're gonna be using. The next part is pattern recognition. So we're gonna identify all kinds of patterns within the story because the patterns are in the story circle already. All those pieces are already put together. We have an algorithm design that's following the path of the story circle. That's gonna be our algorithm. So algorithms are how computers are programmed in order to give you something. So um, if we look at something like social media, is Instagram used out here? You only do Instagram? People that are popular on Instagram, what they do is they play the algorithm, is what it's called. There are certain words you can use in, in, inside of Instagram to make your posts go up higher. There are certain poses you can actually use in Instagram that the computer will read that'll make your posts go up higher. So people are using that pattern, the pattern recognition inside of Instagram. There's hashtags you can use, there's certain people you can follow. All those things are gonna make your post become more important. Um, in the same way as uh, search engine optimization is used inside of websites. So we're gonna look for those patterns, and then we're gonna look at abstraction. The ability to create our own story out of nothing. We're gonna take something just completely random, and you are gonna make a story. So abstraction, once again, it's a process of making something easier to understand while you ignore some pieces. So if I asked you, give me the, uh, what are the directions to get to your home? Right, and you just picture your home right now. And if a stranger's asking you for instructions, okay, and you're picturing out, what am I gonna say? Now, I imagine you're not giving every single step along the way. You're cutting it down to some major, major pieces. So if you're in a city, you may say, go to the first traffic light, make a right, and then drive down till you see a Kentucky Fried Chicken and make a left, something like that, right? You're not gonna say, make a right at the first traffic light you're gonna pass 17 houses. And each one of those houses, it's gonna be, there's gonna be a purple one, and then a blue one, and then a yellow one, and then a white one, and one's gonna have, right? You're skipping all those things, because they're not important, right? You only need the main things. 
And once again, decomposition, breaking it down into smaller pieces. In storytelling, the idea of decomposition, how can we make it into smaller pieces? Well, one, identify the antagonist. Identify the protagonist. Who's the hero? Who's the enemy? What's the setting? Where are they? Right? If you ask somebody to tell you a story, you can start off with those easy ones. Who's the hero? If you're telling the story, probably you. Right? I'm the hero. I'm going to tell you about how I became a librarian. And you're going to center yourself as the hero. You're probably there going to go straight to the setting. Well, I went to school. Where did you go? And you're going to describe that. And then some kind of conflict. I had to study really hard. I had to read a lot. I was working and doing that at the same time. And then the end, what's the resolution? Right? So we're going to be using these pieces in the sense of Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. So in the story that you're going to write right now, you're going to need to identify the protagonist, who's the hero, what's the setting, where is the story happening, what kind of conflict are they having, and then what's the resolution? How does it all work and come together in the end? In computer programming, we have something called conditional statements, which usually means if then. So a conditional statement, it's something that will only run a command if something happens. So if you think about, um, if you're trying to log into Google, Right, so you open up Google and then the password pops up and you have to type in your password in order to access your email or access your Google Drive. That's a conditional statement. It's saying you have to, a user has to know this password or else they cannot move forward. That's what we would call a conditional statement. So in Harry Potter, Harry Potter is really popular in the United States and over here, does it, anyone read Harry Potter here or know what Harry Potter is? Okay, it's, it's a book about wizards. A book about wizards and non-wizards and they all go to school together. And the wizards live among us in everyday life, right? They, they could be in here, um, and we, we wouldn't know. They're very playful wizards, right? They're like good wizards. Um, and one of the ways they get selected and they have to go to school. And when the wizards go to school, in order to get to the school, they go to a train station. And the train station's lined up with every terminal, one, two, three, four, five. But there's a very particular one that's called nine and three quarters, the platform. So there's no other fraction in all the things. You just see whole numbers. But the wizards know that if they see the one that says nine and three quarters, they can run through the wall because they're witches or they're wizards. And they can run through the wall and that'll send them to Hogwarts, which is the school they go to. So that's a conditional statement. So we're gonna include some kind of conditional statement. Something has to happen in order for the story to progress. So that's how we're gonna be thinking about these conditional statements. Another thing we have in computer science and uh, computer programming is loops. So loops are things that we do in computer programming. It's an instruction that in order for something to happen, it has to just repeat and repeat and repeat until something's specified. So an example of this is um, genies, which are also really the Americanized version of the genie, says that the magical genie is, lives in a lamp. And if you find a lamp, you'll have this similar type of genie here. I know they're different culturally. So this, this one lives in a lamp. In order for the genie to come out, if you rub it three times, the genie will come out of the lamp. And when the genie comes out of the lamp, which is a, like a magical, mystical creature, they will grant you three wishes. They'll give you whatever three wishes you want. But by the time you do the third wish, the genie goes back into the bottle or the genie's freed. So in order for the story to progress, you must rub it three times. And that's an example of a loop, right? Because you do it once, you do it twice, you do it three times. And you see this frequently in American media, something like The Wizard of Oz, right? a big movie where the, the hero has to click her heels three times in order for something to happen. So these are these loops that must happen in order for things to continue. Another thing we have in computer science, one of the big ones, and com computational thinking, is the idea of debugging. So debugging is when you test your code, because it, you probably have the word something's buggy or something's not working right. There's a computer bug, there's a computer glitch. That comes from the idea of debugging. And what it means is that you, when you write a new program, sometimes it's not going to work and you have to test it with multiple people multiple times, over and over and over to make sure it works. So in storytelling, the idea of debugging comes from plot holes. So when you write a story, it's really good to work with an editor. If you're writing a long paper, if you're writing an article, it's usually good to have a copy editor. The copy editor is looking, in a sense, they're debugging your script that you write. They're debugging your article. They're looking for mistakes. They're looking for misspellings. They're looking for incomplete sentences or unclear ideas, that debugging process. So we'll go through our story, and we're going to debug it and just make sure that there aren't any plot holes, that it makes sense, that the story makes sense as we go through it. What we're going to do, we're going to have a task. We're going to pass out these tiny blocks. Well, the, right now they're strips. You're going to have to tear them off into little blocks. We're going to give you some story building blocks. 
they have characters, they have settings, they have uh, tasks to accomplish. You're going to create a flow chart with multiple story paths. So you're going to lay these out on the table, and you're going to kind of add them together in order to build your story. It'll make sense when you have these in front of you. So we're going to construct the story following the story circle. Right? You need to go, find, search, and come back home. So we're going to use that to build our story. So we're going to identify the protagonist. Who's the hero? What's the setting? Where are they? What's the conflict? What's the challenge? What's the resolution? How do they solve the challenge? And then the ending, what, what happens in the end? So here's the challenges. We have to include a conditional statement in the story, right? In order for the story to progress, if this happens, then you can progress. So there has to be some kind of thing that must happen for it to compress, to continue. And we need to include at least one loop. So the loop is something has to happen a multiple amount of times in order for the story to progress. So like I said, in, in one case, this uh, hero in one movie had to click her heels three times in order to go back home. So we're gonna think about it that way. And then we'll debug our stories to fix any problems. So we'll maybe share your story with the person next to you and they'll say, that makes no sense, that could not happen. Right, and that's debugging. Then you don't have to go back and fix it and try to make it happen again. So this, this is what the um, blocks will look like. You have these strips. If you look at Dr. Moore, she has the strips over there that are colored. So the yellow ones will be your protagonist. These are the protagonists you can work with. There's a robot, there's a librarian, there's a crocodile, there's a farmer, and there's a wild card, which means you can make it whatever you want. You have a setting, Matatu. You have Saturn's largest move, Titan. You have a mall, a shopping mall, a mountaintop, or a wild card. You have a challenge, you lost something, injured part of a body, burned a special meal, you broke something, something broke. Or, like once again, a wild card. And we're only going to let you use uh, one wild card per story. Yeah. And then the endings. So the endings we have, uh, you found a magic olive tree. They lived happily ever after. They became best friends. They won first place. Or a wild card, something that you come up with. So it makes sense. So if we just go down, we'd say a farmer who lived on a mountaintop broke their arm, and they became best friends. I don't know, but that's basically how it would work, right? And we say, that, we need to debug that. It doesn't make sense. They broke their arm, they became best friends with what? Right, so you have to think about it logically in order to build it. Feel free to move around or move your chairs, reconfigure the room. <laughs>